Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome. Please come on in and grab a seat. Um, there's a nice big crowd here this morning, but there's still plenty of seats, especially towards the front. So just come up and grab a seat. Uh, don't be afraid of sitting next to a stranger. It's a good opportunity to make a new friend. So just uh, come on in. It's, it's a real pleasure uh, to welcome you and, and kind of a thrill for us all because this is the first annual conference on public health and the built environment. So you are part of the beginning of something we hope will be very, very big and grow from year to year. And of course, the theme of this conference is that the physical environment in which we live has a big effect on our health. And that we, the people in this room and others, working together, public health, architects, planners, designers, builders, private sector, public sector, we have the opportunity to shape our physical environment and improve the health of uh, ourselves, our families, our neighborhoods, and this beautiful community of, of San Antonio and Bear County in which we live. Um, how, how many people here in the audience today are not local, are from out of town? Could you raise your hand? Okay, well, that, that's great. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I hope that you'll have time while you're here to see some of San Antonio, and I would especially recommend our fabulous River Mission Reach, uh, which is the portion of the San Antonio River that goes south, south of downtown for miles and miles and miles. Um, that is definitely worth doing, uh, and you can walk, jog, kayak, bike, and it's very easy to rent a bike here locally, so, so check that out. Um, how many in the audience are public health people of one sort or another? How many are not public health people but represent some other discipline? Well, I'd say that's pretty half and half. So uh, that's impressive and that's what we were hoping for, actually. And we want to especially thank the uh, Texas Public Health Association, uh, which we are piggybacking onto their conference begins tomorrow, their annual educational conference. Um, how many in the audience will be attending the TPHA conference for the rest of the week? Okay, so some, but most not. Um, great. Uh, and we, we appreciate the, the chance to link up with TPHA and serve as a bridge uh, because this is something that in some respects is new to public health. Um, so we wanna really um, uh, engage our own colleagues on this issue. Um, I wanna thank the, the sponsors of this conference who supported this financially and uh, with uh, their uh, contributions of time and expertise. Uh, City of San Antonio Department of Planning and Development, thank you very much. Uh, UTSA College of Architecture. And while you're here today, many of the UTSA architectural students are here and they have a display in the lobby that you'll want to uh, look at and, and talk to the students about projects they've been working at. Um, very much want to thank the uh, San Antonio chapter of the American Institute of Architects, AIA, which um, is very, very engaged in this whole notion of public health in the built environment. And they sponsored uh, a lunchtime lecture uh, several months ago that was very well attended at the, at the stables at the Pearl Brewery that highlighted uh, this issue, so in, in many ways this is a, a continuation of that. And uh, also want to thank the, the UTSA School of Public Health, 
uh, and San Antonio B-Cycle, that's our bicycle sharing system here locally that you'll see the, the gray racks of bicycles all over town. Very easy to, easy to rent them with a credit card. Um, and tonight, there will be two special ways to get to the evening reception that I hope you will all attend. The evening reception is at La Gloria, which is a little indoor-outdoor restaurant on the, the Pearl Brewery campus, which is just about a mile upriver from here. So you can easily walk there from the, uh, uh, from the hotel here. Um, you can also go on a special walking tour led by UTSA architectural students walking on the river from here to the evening reception and they'll kind of point out highlights on the way and there are many highlights. It's, they have some very uh, fabulous works of art and architecture all along the river. Um, or you can uh, rent a bike with B-cycles and ride there uh, in about 10 minutes actually and uh, they, if there's enough interest in that, uh, we'll have some extra bikes v available right here. I'm told you can download a, uh, an app, whatever that means, uh, to, to rent a B-cycle, but if you want to do that, ask, because it's very easily done. And uh, also in the lobby, there, there are other tables set up, other displays. In particular, Witty Museum, which is a great partner, and Twig Books, which will be selling a number of titles uh, that have to do with this uh, subject. If uh, you uh, would like to view the, in, the, the sessions uh, after today, or you want to recommend it to a friend or colleague, they will be available on Nowcast SA, and they're being filmed now by uh, our local nonprofit organization uh, that does wonderful work putting into uh, video and audio uh, events like this to make it available to everybody. And then last of all, uh, a good reason to come back to San Antonio if you're from out of town is for Ciclovia on uh, April Sunday, April 7th, which is a, a total blast. We uh, we close down a major street and have bicycling, skateboarding, every form of alternative transportation, non-motorized transportation, going up and down in kind of a carnival atmosphere for the whole day, and I would invite you to that. And last of all, I would like to thank the uh, Mayor's Fitness Council, which was, is the major financial sponsor for this uh, conference and uh, through their, their board of volunteers have done so much uh, to promote this and uh, particularly the Active Living Council, which is a component, um, is, uh, has, has been very supportive. And I would like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Ned Zaharoff, who's the chair of the Active Living Council and a, mayor, and a member of the Mayor's Fitness Council to tell us a little bit more about that. Dr. Zaharov is a sports medicine physician. Uh, she is uh, very active in uh, team sports as well as just promoting fitness and health uh, locally. Um, and she's been an inspiration. She continues to be an inspiration for many of us and we're gl so glad that she's here and part of this. Annette, please come up. Wow. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Dr. Schlenker and uh, Metro Health for inviting me to actually be the warm-up band for uh, Rick Bell this morning. I told them I wouldn't take too many jokes. In fact, I don't have any. It's too early for me to be funny. So we're going to... So this morning I have a few minutes to introduce some concepts with the Active Living Council. And three years ago our council didn't exist, so I think we've come quite a, quite a long way. 
In fact, um, our council was initially developed through a CDC grant that was awarded to the Metro Health Department, and through that, they had the uh, foresight to really create an active living council, one of which is one of the only local councils in the United States. And our mission really, as you see, is to transform Bear County and San Antonio into a healthy community through active living. So we've had the opportunity with uh, funding initially to set out in a mission and vision to do that and promote active lifestyles throughout the community. Our group is very unique in that we've modeled our, our membership after the National Activity Plan. And this model actually looks at a variety of sectors within the community, understanding that our whole mission is really trying to reduce obesity in the community as well as reduce sedentary lifestyles. So our own membership is made up of eight different sectors, including an additional group of community representatives. And as, as you can see, it's really a, a widespread group to take a look at acting as a forum for all of the community to be able to have input into issues regarding active living and to uh, be able to provide a perspective that represents the community as a whole in developing and outlining future plans for our city. So in our initial project, our, one of our directives was actually creating a master plan, which was a three to five year plan to help promote active living as a way of life, as a way to change attitudes and change our environment in the community to actually promote active living. So I'd like to just highlight uh, that plan today with the time I have. The name of our plan is the Active Living Plan for a Healthier San Antonio. And this plan is modeled after the National Physical Activity Plan. And it's sharing the vision of being able to have all Americans one day be physically active, not only where they play, but where they work and where they live. And our job is to help implement programs, policies, and help change the infrastructure that allows our environment to actually support active living. So in that plan, one of the things that we've done is we had created policy recommendations to present to our local government, local city, city officials, that look at the type of uh, developments that we're promoting and what type of form-based and type of coding that we're using for development. So we're looking at infrastructure and policy development. One of the other policy recommendations we've made is actually looking at our planning commissions and providing a, a health element to it. So we can take a look at health impact assessments and decide how our infrastructure is being built. In outlining that plan, we've looked at all the various sectors within the community to represent not only local priorities, but aligning with our local initiatives. And so in that plan, we've taken each of our sectors and actually contributed specific strategies, tactics, and measurable outcomes. So we can take a look at not only where we are today, but where our work's leading us to to uh, com come to a healthier group in terms of a, our community. One of the other very unique things about this plan is that it's a very good example of public and private sector collaboration because it's taking a look at not only what our st uh, private stakeholders in the community represent, but our public interests in the Metro Health Department, our local officials, in terms of moving that needle towards a healthier community in San Antonio. The plan itself is based off the National Physical Activity Plan, and because of that, we were able to use a lot of evidence-based information to promote the strategies and tactics that are outlined in it. And we've taken a national plan and localized it and prioritized it for all the different socioeconomic groups and demographic groups in San Antonio. And this encourages a lot of partnerships, a lot of collaboration, as I mentioned, with public and private sectors. And one of the most important and key points to take this plan forward is really taking a look at how it supports not only local initiatives, but aligning with national initiatives as well to promote health and fitness in our community. So one of the things that we're very proud of is that we have been recognized nationally by the Physical Activity Research Network. And they've asked us and we have uh, completed a submission of a manuscript to be published in the Journal of the Physical Activity and Health. And hopefully what this will do is outline our process that we went through in developing our council, as well as our planning and processing and implementation of taking our plan forward. 
Our next steps are vast. We are looking at implementing this plan that's going to need engagement of all the institutions and organizations and local community members and stakeholders. And it's also partly to increase our public awareness. So we're looking at developing other programs that will recognize community members and stakeholders in activities that they do to promote active living. And one of the key components for sustainability for this is really collaborating with this private and, and public sector group because it's really the alignments that we've established, not only with our local groups such as SA2020, Metro Health, our Mayor's Fitness Council, but taking a look at all the national initiatives that are being set forth so we can ride on the momentum of the, that information and take advantage of it at a local level. So we've been very fortunate in having a lot of support from our local health district, our local government, and certainly our dynamic mayor, Mayor uh, Julian Castro, who I think has been very, very helpful in instituting and carrying this momentum forward to help bring active living as a way of life in our community. So I just want to thank all those groups for their sponsorship and help in our work. We also have set up a table outside that will provide information further on how to get information about our council, as well as links to the plan, and we'd love to hear feedback from you so we can get more input. This plan is a living document and hopefully will evolve as our momentum continues to grow in San Antonio. Thank you. Good job, Annette. Thank you very much, Annette. Now it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Mr. Rick Bell from New York City, who flew in uh, last night, barely made it at 1 a.m., but he's here and, and ready to go. We're just thrilled uh, to have Rick, who uh, has, uh, is an architect himself, and at, at one time he was the uh, assistant commissioner for the Department of Design and Construction of New York City, and uh, at other times he has been a, a principal in a, a private uh, architectural firm uh, with offices in the United States and Europe, um, and currently, and so he's been all around the globe, uh, currently he is the executive director of the American Institute of Architects of New York City, so it's the sister organization to our own AIA here locally. And uh, particularly impressive is that he has organized the New York City Fit City um, conference uh, for, uh, for the past uh, several years. Um, and has been a uh, principal uh, author of the uh, fabulous active design guidelines that New York City uses to develop their own physical uh, infrastructure. And this, this is uh, just a fabulous book. And if you have a chance, uh, take a look through it um, because it's truly impressive what they have done in New York City, and uh, I think we will learn a lot uh, where uh, th that maybe contrasts us with uh, New York City, but also some things that uh, where we are uh, similar to them. So Rick, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time out. Um, thank you, Dr. Schlenker. And it's a real pleasure to be here. As uh, you were saying, I came in late last night, a little bit later than I expected because there was snow on the runways. It was so cold. Uh, there was a flash blizzard, and uh, I think the uh, Denver-based uh, United crew very much wanted to get out of New York before they were slammed in for a few days. So um, I, on the plane, thinking that maybe I wouldn't get here, I actually wrote out the remarks so that uh, either Dr. Schlenker or, 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 or Tessie or Carol might, might actually read it. Um, that's a terrible thing to do, but if it makes the presentation a little bit more flowing, uh, 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 we'll blame it on sleep deprivation. Um, I also should probably say thank you for the kind words. Um, I've had a checkered career uh, in the public sector, uh, private sector, uh, now in not-for-profit. And hearing such kind words, I, I would say I don't deserve them. Uh, to paraphrase a speech Mayor Bloomberg gave uh, just last week, but he said, I don't deserve arthritis either. 
<laughs> I was going to say sleep deprivation, but I'll blame that on United. Um, you know, I think it was in the Texas Monthly a while back, uh, obviously, that Molly Ivins wrote about how to give a speech. Um, and she said, you know, you start with a joke, you put the meat in the middle, and then you end by waving the flag. And I thought I'd flip it, <laughs> not knowing any jokes, uh, not knowing any Texas jokes, um, apart from uh, those I've cribbed from Molly Ivins and maybe from Ann Richards. Uh, Ann Richards, the former governor, is the subject of a musical now on Broadway. I think it's played in Texas before. So I tried seeing if I could find something uh, relevant. Uh, the jokes from the governor aren't really applicable to mixed company. And thank you, Tom, for finding out that you are mixed company. Health professionals, design professionals. Are there any politicians, any elected officials in the room? Good. <laughs> I guess. Um, uh, Molly Ivins also said, uh, good thing we've still got politics in Texas, finest form of free entertainment ever invented. Um, so the subject of the talk today um, um, is, well, yes, public health in the built environment, and in particular, uh, Fit City and the Active Design Guidelines. Um, you know, the creation of the Active Design Guidelines um, was very multifaceted. There was a bunch of different city agencies, the Department of Design and Construction, where I used to work, but also um, primarily the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in combination with the Department of City Planning, the Department of Buildings, Department of Parks, Department of Transportation. There were just lots and lots of people involved with that. Um, and if I were to give them all credit, it would take way too long. But um, I'm, I basically did the dedication page, which was the easy part. But we also did host at AI New York uh, conferences um, that brought people together to sort of get out of their silos and their comfort zones and to start thinking uh, in a sort of interdisciplinary or transsectorial way. Um, and I was going to try to think about those dream teams of people coming together, you know, Mickey Mantle and Kinky Friedman on the same team, uh, but unfortunately they never did get to play together or write together. Uh, so um, I'll be describing examples um, of buildings um, uh, and sites that incorporate the principles of the design guidelines uh, and essentially talk to public health policy as seen through the eyes of architects and planners, landscape architects. Um, last time I was in not this room but not too far away in San Antonio I was at a College of Preventive Medicine conference just about two years ago. I don't know if anyone there for that. Um, it's on Riverwalk. Uh, uh, I was there not as a speaker. I was hanging out, poster session. Uh, my wife's an epidemiologist, uh, worked for the CDC for a while, and was an EIS officer. That's how I got this wonderful tie. I'm told you're not supposed to wear ties in Texas. I'll take it off. But, uh, um, you know, uh, it was our 30th wedding anniversary, and she was coming to San Antonio, and I said, you know, it's silly for me to uh, uh, be anywhere else. So I had a lot of free time. And I got to walk pretty much the length of Riverwalk from the AIA San Antonio, uh, wonderful center for architecture at the Pearl Brewery, over down to uh, King William and and uh, area around the flour mill and Blue Star. And um, because it was our anniversary, I guess I fell in love all over again uh, with with the city. <laughs> and, uh, um, so, um, you know, speaking of my wife's involvement with CDC, I think I better get into the talk really fast. <laughs> and uh, uh, if there are, um, if there's anybody who ha has seen these statistics already, and I'm sure many have from uh, the BRFSS, uh, I used to know what that stands for, Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. Uh, if you've seen these statistics before, um, you get another cup of coffee, you know, or go to Oklahoma or even Colorado because uh, I think uh, what it shows um, is uh, uh, how this epidemic of obesity and overweight has taken over just about the entire country with the possible exception of Colorado. Um, there we see it. Um, and, you know, usually people, when they talk about why Colorado stands out, why it's a little bit different, say, well, maybe it's self-selection, you know, people like to hike or backpack or ski, be outside, gravitate there. They, 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 they go there on their own, and therefore the BMI statistics are better in Colorado by a kind of a artificial self-selection. Um, 
I look at them and, and others too and say, well, you know, it's actually not that great in Colorado. Uh, if the average overweight rate, obesity rate in the country is approaching a third, uh, it's not so great to say that a fifth of the people in Colorado, the best state in the country in that regard, are, are overweight. It should be going in the opposite direction. Um, the um, book itself, and, and, and thank you, Tom, for holding it up. I was going to do the same. Uh, uh, is organized in four chapters, and I've tried to take very literally the suggestion to talk about the book, its genesis, how it came together, um, uh, what's in it, and, and uh, what it means for uh, uh, our city and maybe other cities as well, how it's being implemented. Uh, but um, I thought I'd follow um, the book almost as a script, not read from it. Uh, it is available online. I have a couple of copies along uh, with me if, if, if people really need for uh, talk they're giving later today or tomorrow or some other purpose, a hard copy right away. It could be gotten from our municipal government from city books, but it is available online. The website is coming up. But uh, there are four chapters, and the first one talks about the uh, environmental health underpinning of what we were trying to do together across these disciplinary lines, uh, the sort of uh, uh, environmental health epidemiological basis for why we think as architects and, and, and planners that uh, changes uh, that we make could have an impact. And just this morning early in the hotel room, I was trying to remember um, who Jon Snow was and why the CDC tie has a, has, a, has a pump on it. And it's a fascinating story back to 1854 and the cholera outbreak in Soho in London. And you probably in the health professional side of the room, it's like bride and groom. It's not exactly divided up evenly, but it's half and half. Um, fascinating story about how, in that case, the physician, but also at almost the same time in New York, 1857 was the time, not only when the AIA was founded in New York, but when Central Park was created. Um, and um, Central Park was called the working person's, working man's, I guess at the time, lungs, uh, a way of looking at how fresh air and um, recreational opportunities, wasn't called that then, um, uh, could change the patterns of density and, and um, um, public health problems that came with that um, in, in, in a very dismal and crowded housing stock. Uh, uh, architects, planners, reformers, uh, far th ahead thinking elected officials were already talking about changes in the codes and issues pertaining to housing typologies to try to get more light and air into dwellings. Well, um, to hear... Um, to start with, uh, uh, Dick Jackson, Dr. Richard Jackson, who had been at the CDC um, and then became, uh, among other things, state health officer in California, uh, talk about the complicity of architects in the obesity epidemic with images that included, um, I think when he lived in Atlanta, there was a photo of someone walking their dog, usually a great way of getting exercise, but there were no sidewalks in that particular part of Atlanta. Um, so the person walking his dog had the leash literally out the window of the car, out of the right passenger side window of the car. You don't have to see the image to realize its absurdity. There was another image in that first slideshow I heard Dick give almost a decade ago, um, showing a uh, strip mall in San Diego with a fitness center uh, on the second floor, a two-story building, uh, um, parking lot in the front of it, an escalator up to the sign, fits fitness center. Um, uh, what we do to avoid physical activity uh, is legion. So we were very receptive in New York. Uh, the, the, the kind of confusing image on, uh, on, on the left shows those CDC, CDC statistics uh, made out of paint, uh, cans painted with the colors that were on the CDC charts. Uh, in an uh, exhibition we did um, just after uh, Dick gave a talk to the AI in, in Washington, D.C., that tried to talk about the design implications of obesity. Uh, the curator, Letitia Wolf, was particularly fascinated by graphic designers as being part of the problem, getting people to make unhealthy food choices by their skill in relation to the advertising industry. Just a couple of quick images from the book, uh, um, um, slightly reformatted to try to get the um, city of uh, San Antonio flag into the picture, or at least its colors. Um, the difference between the rates of chronic disease um, and infectious disease in New York, how that's changed over time um, from the 1880s um, when infectious diseases were the primary uh, uh, um, cause of death uh, uh, to um, uh, how that more recently has uh, uh, impacted um, 
what health professionals are doing. Uh, similarly, um, how despite some recent good news, not enough, uh, uh, rates of childhood ob uh, obesity in New York City parallel those in the country. Um, the Fit City conferences that referenced um, started, um, I guess it's now eight years ago, we'll be doing the eighth such conference in June this year. Um, and just like, I guess, World War I, we didn't know that there would necessarily be Fit City II a year later, so we just called it Fit City. My title, the health department nixed it, was Obesity. They thought that was just too cute by half. <laughs> Uh, Fit City has caught on, uh, and, and we've um, uh, done, these are the covers of proceedings of the conferences. These are all available also online. Um, um, but by the third such conference, uh, um, one of the architects present, um, David Burney, who uh, is also commissioner of the Department of Design and Construction, said the proceedings of a conference aren't good enough. They're interesting to record what people said, maybe to give insight or to be interpolable to other places, other times. But, but guidelines were really necessary to codify in some way the principles that were being discussed at these conferences to make the case studies more relevant. Um, and generalizable, and that guidelines were not hard to do, and we should do them and get them out before the next such conference, and leading a very talented and, and diverse team. Um, uh, he did that, we did that together, but I give David Burney a lot of the credit, not just for the idea, but for carrying it through. Um, I also give our health department uh, the lion's share of the credit for uh, saying that this wasn't just an affectation of architects. Um, uh, our, um, Health Commissioner back then, Tom Frieden, has moved on to Atlanta. Um, we get Tom Frieden and Tom Farley mixed up in New York all the time, um, uh, but we see Tom Farley out in the park a little bit more, and that's him. Um, if you could read the caption, it calls him Superman, and, and, and uh, maybe any public health professional who is getting that many uh, slings and arrows. Uh, uh, I, I could talk about a lot of other public health policy issues and tobacco and uh, um, soft drinks, uh, that's probably made it into the national press, uh, but I won't. Uh, uh, on the other side of the image, uh, 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 dressing to look like he's a member of the AIA in black and red is uh, Jan Gal, who's an architect and urbanist uh, from Copenhagen, who in that city has probably had more to do uh, uh, with creation of bike lanes, a network of, uh, of, of ways that people can bicycle, not just for recreation, but to get to work. I think the statistics currently are over two-thirds or around two-thirds of the population of Copenhagen gets to work, um, despite a climate very similar to New York, uh, um, by bicycle every day. Um, I'm told it's a smaller city, it's a more condensed city, it's, it's a flatter city, but I was there once in November and it was very cold. You know, I was wearing a warm wool overcoat and you could still easily get a bicycle and go everywhere uh, to do that. The book itself, as I said, is in these four chapters. Um, I won't read the words on them, but you know, it talks to in the, the health issues, then urban design issues, building issues in, within the buildings themselves. And synergies, uh, a word I won't use again, um, but basically the linkages to other initiatives both in the city and in the country. Um, the um, Fit City conferences have started to increasingly bring together the decision makers in the city. You see, uh, let's see, seven commissioners ranging from Fatima Amer, uh, uh, from buildings, Amanda Burden from our planning department and so forth and so on. Um, I'm not sure how much we've learned, to be honest, from Copenhagen or San Antonio, but we do learn how to do things in New York based on how they play on the road. And if someone has a really good idea about bike lanes in Copenhagen, we do it. I'll be talking a bit about San Antonio as the generator for us of lessons learned about linear parks and how things that could be attractive to visitors, convention, conference goers, uh, could also work really, really well for residents. Um, a year later, they're still there. Uh, I was trying to see whether they were wearing the same clothes, if these really were <laughs> different years. Uh, you see our health commissioner smiling in the middle, and his tie is similar, but not the same. Next to him, Jeanette Sadik Khan with the black uh, head, I don't know, scarf. Uh, seems not to be wearing it there. So this is, in fact, uh, um, uh, uh, the year after, last year. Uh, uh, when we were also um, graced by the presence of Linda Gibbs, who's our Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services. Um, if you come to Fit City 8, I think it's on June 23rd, the, for the architects in the room, the Monday after convention in Denver, um, 
uh, you'll maybe see the mayor there. Uh, if I say lots of people are coming from San Antonio and elsewhere, maybe he'll show up. But we've taken the show on the road uh, already to some degree by uh, looking at similar issues with people from other cities. Uh, uh, this was um, during grassroots a couple years ago uh, when we were benefiting from some CDC money uh, that came through our health department to the AIA. It was Stimulus Act money, and we had a bunch of Fit Nation uh, efforts then. Um, um, Shelly Tika from HUD, and then in New Orleans workshops. I was going to show images of bicyclists uh, that a photographer in New Orleans, uh, uh, Julie Demansky, sent me. Uh, they were just incredible images. New Orleans is such a beautiful city. This was during um, the convention there, uh, also two years ago. Um, but it occurred to me that um, the folks in New York City Health Department would never let me use those slides because while the bicycles were beautiful, the buildings were beautiful, the people looked very healthy, they weren't wearing uh, much uh, in the way of helmets. So we will never use a photo in New York uh, of a bicyclist without a helmet for obvious and good public health reasons. My wife trained as a pediatrician in the accidents you see. And that's a debate in Europe and elsewhere. If bicycles go slowly enough, maybe the risks are somewhat less, uh, but I don't think so. Uh, we have not exactly linked ourselves umbilically to Copenhagen and Denmark, but uh, last year we did an exhibition with a um, Danish uh, conceptual artist you see in the picture. I had seen in Copenhagen um, that um, sign, it says jumping zone, uh, with a sort of a 10 foot or a 3 meter white taped square. People see the sign and are prompted to jump, and the artist, Rosan Bosch, was uh, uh, in New York, um, uh, trying to figure out how to make that show relevant to New Yorkers' mentality. And we had, apart from this sign, a couple of others out on the sidewalk, because ultimately active design is about the everyday life possibilities of exercise, how architects, artists, and others can create that. So she said, well, you know, we'll do something that is American that would never fly in, in Copenhagen. I, I suggested um, jumping jacks. We called it jumping jacks and jills, and there were two stick figures, and people started doing that on the street like we did back then in elementary school. But the one that she really liked is her interpretation of culture was called the uh, weightlifting zone, and it was a stick figure holding up um, bench, well, not bench pressing, pressing uh, two shopping bags <laughs> full of uh, whatever Prada shoes. Um, the uh, health background and the build up to the creation of the design guidelines uh, I could talk about, especially with the public health audience at great length, but um, uh, what really is interesting to me about the book are the actual physical examples and how they relate to principles. Uh, under urban design, there are something like 13 of them. I just cribbed a few pages from the book. I won't read all the text, but can get a quality, a sense of the quality if not of the ideas, I hope that too, but of the imagery. Uh, these aren't my photos, and, and uh, uh, the uh, issues uh, attendant to urban design, including play space. Part of our Plan YC environmental plan is to uh, make sure that there is a recreational opportunity, a plaza public space park, within 10 minutes of every New Yorker's uh, uh, domicile or, or, or workplace. Uh, um, and, and that along with making it easier to get to places where those occur, um, encouraging more pedestrian experiences is a part of what the urban design section is about. But there are 13 principles, and uh, I'd written them down so I could say them all at once, but I won't bother, I guess, going off script, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and uh, uh, the first is, is, is a mix of land use that, uh, uh, you know, how does that contribute to active design? Well, um, in this particular housing complex recently opened in the South Bronx called Via Verde, which was built according to the precepts and principles of active design, started as an AIA competition with our city's housing agency, HPD. Um, uh, there are a lot of exterior stairways, and this photo doesn't necessarily give a sense of the overall connectivity of rooftops where there's agriculture, urban agriculture, gardens, community gardens. Uh, but um, uh, a, a variety of ways of moving through the building that wouldn't, one wouldn't ordinarily see in social housing, including uh, wonderful stairwells, fire stairs that benefit from natural light um, um, and bright colors and a sense of not just safety, but of um, welcome. Um, uh, transit opportunities. Uh, um, I could talk a lot about what's happening in Lima where my daughter lives and where she just had 
uh, my first grandchild, Andres, at, in a hospital in Miraflores. Um, incredible transit rich city, uh, chaotic uh, bus rapid transit, as well as multiple ways of getting around a city that is larger than New York in population and sprawl. Uh, uh, confusing uh, for the first time, but increasingly navigable as one deciphers it. Um, the recreational opportunities that can be there year-round, but also sometimes spring up uh, on occasion. I have a similar photo, I think, later in the show from Los Angeles, uh, where ice skating uh, seems even less plausible. I don't say yet that we, thanks to global warming, can ice skate year-round in New York, but it's on the edge of spring and that rink is still there. Um, play areas that um, um, can be even in the middle of some very intensely developed uh, office parks, uh, office areas, industrial, commercial areas, uh, as this one in Tokyo, um, and then creating places that look sedentary on the face of it, but become pedestrian destinations. Um, one of the authors of uh, the Active Design Guidelines was a landscape architect and urban designer named Charles Mc McKinney, from, uh, originally from Arkansas, who uh, is in charge of urban design for the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. He said if you want to encourage people, uh, especially those with mobility problems, uh, to walk more in, in parks, put in more benches. Well, this is probably the biggest bench in New York, or one of them. And uh, coincident with it, we've now closed the major artery in New York, Broadway, not just uh, for summer streets, our version of Ciclavia, uh, but uh, forever. And um, one of the legacies of the Bloomberg administration, which has done a lot of good things in this regard, uh, is to leave things behind that will be hard to reverse, to say that a principal street in New York, or part of it anyway, in the heart of uh, the crossroads of America is uh, a pedestrian uh, uh, destination, uh, a place where there are tables and chairs, but also uh, uh, with the TKTS booth for Broadway just underneath this. Uh, so I photographed this a zillion times, and finally got the screen and back to say new thinking, new possibilities. And if you look closely at the next image not shown, it, it's the logo for the, the axiom, the mantra for a car company. So I probably shouldn't be thinking about it too much. But what we have been seeing, um, as we talk a lot about transit and, uh, and intermodal transit in particular, the Farley Building, not named after our health commissioner, but, uh, but who knows, uh, is the general post office, the place uh, in New York where you could go 24-7, pay your taxes on April 15th, even if it's a Sunday. Um, uh, it's also directly across the street from the principal train station, or one of the two principal train stations in New York, and is in play as uh, the next uh, uh, 21st century train station for Amtrak, uh, if that ever gets funded adequately. But that station named after Senator Moynihan um, uh, is just one of many, many locations where the push carts selling food on the streets of New York are no longer just the boiled hot dogs and the conditions of my youth, but increasingly fresh fruit, uh, fresh fruit of all stripes. And the availability of produce, uh, not just in a um, major commercial center, uh, but in residential neighborhoods where there are inadequate provision of uh, fruits and vegetables uh, has uh, started to change the way um, our health department thinks uh, New Yorkers are, are buying and getting their food. Um, it could be more, and I'm proposed to say it's not just on the sidewalk, but take part of the Farley building itself as a produce market. Um, you think of the market buildings in San Francisco for the ferry terminal, um, Pike's Market in Seattle, uh, to make a destination both for commuters and residents, uh, a distribution point for fresh food, and maybe even a bike center like we see in Chicago and Santa Monica and other places. Um, but when you do have uh, street connectivity, complete streets, so forth, part of that is not just the availability of uh, food of different stripes, but how social space gets people out of their homes, uh, makes them feel safer as pedestrians, uh, gets them uh, to have the opportunity to walk more, see their neighbors, and, 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 and um, uh, feel like the neighborhood is coming back. The hub is very close to where the housing complex they showed a moment ago is located. Um, Another image of Times Square showing some of the seating. Um, those chairs and tables are not bolted down. Uh, they don't disappear. Uh, uh, these temporary furnishings and, and barriers are uh, about to be replaced by something more permanent designed by uh, the Norwegian firm Snoeta, um, and uh, that's happening very soon. Um, the High Line is our 
upside down version of Riverwalk. Uh, it's a linear park that connects several neighborhoods and being done in three phases, the third phase under construction or about to be now. Um, it's authors from the landscape architecture firm Field Operations and pictured here um, some of the architects, still ask video and Renfro. Um, created something that uh, allows for people to sit you know, and read, drink coffee, look at the river, um, uh, but also uh, uh, to walk without having to stop to cross streets at traffic lights, to walk uh, seeing vegetation, to early in the morning jog uh, before it gets too crowded, uh, and to socialize and be outside. It also penetrates through buildings. It's an interesting experiment in animating a neighborhood, and it was partly the design of the High Line itself. It's gotten a lot of attention, but also the concurrent planning decisions for the adjacent neighborhood that it in allowed for somewhat increased density, different uses. Uh, industrial neighborhood of trucking became one increasingly of housing and of uh, restaurants and, and cafes and bars and galleries. Uh, and uh, um, just like uh, Chong Chong in Seoul, or I would say as a visitor to San Antonio, um, uh, part, part of Riverwalk, uh, the, the, the linear park was the catalyst. Uh, but, you know, looking also at the use of street space, not just for bike lanes, uh, um, not just for pedestrians uh, passing by, uh, but, um, um, but increasingly for incursions, whether they're neck downs to make it easier for people to cross streets, especially if they're moving slowly. Uh, uh, I could tell a George Bush joke here about the definition of walking, but I, 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 I won't. It, I'm about, well, it, it, it just tried to balance it a little bit because I've got a lot of Molly. I've been mean, stuff that I'm skipping over, and uh, he said, "If it looks like I'm strutting, um, that's what Texans call walking." <laughs> I think he was sort of standing still, but. I uh, won't go there. Uh, standing still, uh, uh, this, this is a parking space. You know, how, how do you balance the needs of cars and people? How do you create places where the sidewalks and some of the streets are narrow to get a little bit more sitting space? This isn't, uh, you know, a, a, a franchise, I mean, a concession sidewalk cafe. This is a, a, a design project to try to create a sitting area, I won't say in the middle of the street, but on the edge of it. Uh, the bike network in New York we're very proud of. It's been um, a struggle. Uh, there are neighborhoods where there's so much vehicular congestion that the taking away of a bike lane, especially a protected bike lane, you know, uh, it's somehow separated from the traffic, not just by a painted stripe, but by a physical barrier, whether that's a lane of parking or, or plants, uh, uh, can uh, uh, can be difficult. And, uh, but but it's ultimately been successful, and that's our trend. Transportation Commissioner Jeanette Sada Khan in our space talking about, um, as you can see from her image, the slide of a slide. When do you ever get you know, uh, uh, the, the imminent rollout of the bike share program? Uh, somewhat delayed, uh, but uh, very much anticipated uh, uh, this spring or early summer. Um, New York said that to make bike share logical, to get a Valib type free bike program or, or, or low cost bike program, uh, the, the bike network really had to be there first. Uh, so that's what the city is concentrated on and it's not quite there, but it's close enough. Uh, this is some of it. Um, uh, uh, adjacent to a really beautiful linear park along the Hudson River, uh, but this takes out a lane of traffic on West Street, what had been at one point, like in San Francisco, an elevated highway. Uh, now a surface highway, but carving out a lane of it, uh, separating it by a fence, and then an even better barrier, a row of trucks, uh, makes that even plausible. I talked about Moynihan Station before. This is a deliberately very confusing image of a bike storage facility directly across the street from that post office about to be train station with the graphics from our transportation department about biking in New York City, a photograph on in the advertising panel of the... Uh, of the street furniture, that is exactly the image that you could see if you stand in a certain spot looking at the building. Um, I think this is good as far as it goes. It's great to have opportunities to park a bike under cover, uh, to symbolize uh, 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 more uh, safer bike storage, uh, uh, but the number of spaces is, is pitiful, it's minimal. Um, and uh, I think we're looking at other means of encouraging bike storage, including by zoning changes that bring bicycles within buildings uh, where they're not only protected from the risk of theft and certainly from the weather, uh, but, but, uh, 
but also uh, often create additional and larger spaces. Moving into the third chapter of the book, which is uh, somewhat larger, I think there were 13 principles, if I remember correctly, of the urban design section, a few more on, on, on building design. Um, by the way, I don't know who did this logo for uh, San Antonio, but uh, uh, really, really like it. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to uh, figure out how we can do something like that for New York that isn't just the skyline of Manhattan. Um, images from the book itself about stair visibility and um, um, changes in elevator technology that uh, allow for skip stop elevators uh, uh, while not uh, diminishing the uh, uh, accessibility opportunities for those who uh, uh, do need to have access to each floor. Uh, how stairways can be enhanced aesthetically uh, uh, by art, by natural light, by location. Um, if the uh, image on the uh, your extreme, this side, right of the slide, looks uh, familiar, uh, the Apple stores in New York and around the country now have been designed by uh, one firm, uh, uh, Peter Bolin, Bolin Switsky Jackson, uh, New York in collaboration with Renette Riley. And the thought of using a, a really wonderful stair to not only add value uh, and create additional space within um, uh, the shopping experience in a retail store, this is Apple, but, but also to create social space. Uh, uh, people uh, at the Apple store in Soho, not too far from where I work, um, actually uh, just hang out on that second floor mezzanine and the stair becomes a kind of an arrival, a grand stair, almost like uh, a hotel ballroom may have been in the past. I uh, talked a little bit before about bicycle storage, bicycle parking. Um, but the principles that um, are in the book, I'd rather talk about with some of my own slides and, uh, uh, and my own experiences. The New York Times building by uh, uh, Renzo Piano Building Workshop and FX Fowl um, is extraordinary because they don't have corner offices. Uh, instead of having you know, the uh, separate corner office of someone who's hierarchically more important in the organization, it's where they put um, convenience stairs. Uh, and, uh, um, by most codes, most fire codes, uh, connecting multiple floors is patently uh, illegal. Um, we do it in our own building illegally. Well, the, for the tape, I shouldn't say illegally, uh, not in compliance with the building code. By going back to the building department and getting a, what's called, I guess it's a legal term, reconsideration. Uh, uh, what does that mean? Someone looked at it again and said, you know, if you put your fire doors to the fire stairs on an electromagnet, and that electromagnet is linked to the smoke detector system, the fire detection system. God forbid there's a fire, the smoke detection system breaks the circuit, the fire door closes automatically, and the stair, whether it's pressurized or just a safe haven, uh, becomes the same as it would have been if the door wasn't held open all the time. But with the door held open all the time and an appealing stair environment behind it, um, there's no problem. So we're trying in New York to get that exception to the rule, generalizable, interpolable. And uh, in traveling a little bit, conferences, I saw exactly the same condition in, in Tokyo, a small commercial building with electromagnets holding the doors open. And I asked the person who was giving us a tour of the building, uh, is this legal here? They said, no, we gotta go back to the building department and kind of beg for it, uh, it should be easier. So what the New York Times building did, which is even better, is instead of having uh, uh, doors surrounding the stair. I'm not just inside some threshold with a glass or other door just behind me. Uh, they literally have horizontal fire shutters that are similarly linked to a uh, alarm system. And if there's a fire, um, kind of like the hatch in a boat, bilge hatch, uh, um, the, the floors are separated horizontally, somewhat more expensive, uh, but almost invisible. What you see in this image sort of truncating one of the stair walkers' heads is a black void uh, through which uh, a horizontal shutter, a fire shutter, would, would emerge. Um, here's again the um, um, Apple Store slide I showed a moment ago. It was the cover of our Fit City 2 report, as you're seeing. Uh, but increasingly, this is a building that was just came online this past September, uh, university building, um, just across the street from the World Trade Center site, just north of it, uh, designed by Peacock Fried. And that building uh, came down uh, after September 11th. It's been uh, rebuilt with much, much more um, visible stairs. This is a pretty lousy image. I, I, I took it to show the num numerous floors rather than the beauty of an individual stair that may be more sculptural elsewhere. Uh, and also before the building was occupied uh, by students in the fall. It was actually a construction shot. Uh, much more beautiful stair, uh, probably a little bit more expensive, was uh, 
at the Gates Foundation, does great work in public health and, and, and otherwise. Uh, this is in their new headquarters building, relatively new headquarters building in Seattle by NBBJ. Uh, stairs that people use, well, why do they use them? How do people, how, what's the incentive for people to use stairs? Uh, uh, maybe it's the shortest path of movement. Um, uh, maybe there's a corporate or, or institutional program that incentivizes is added. As at DDC where I used to work, where there was an open atrium and uh, uh, stairs within it. Um, there's a stair day, uh, maybe now a stair week, stair month. This is a stair in uh, my own space, the Center for Architecture. Um, uh, what it doesn't quite show is the stair prompt poster adjacent. That'll come in a later image. Uh, but it does show the vibrant colors, the materials, the light, the sense of openness. And, uh, and increasingly, we're using it as part of an exhibition sequence so that in three floors of gallery space, if you have a show on two floors and that show, that exhibition continues in the stairwell between, people have almost no reason to use the elevator unless, of course, they're carrying something heavy or pushing a stroller or in a wheelchair or walking with a cane or a walker, uh, and we have an elevator right next to it. But we try to do calculations to some degree, unobtrusively, of how many people use the elevator versus the stair when they have that choice and could use either. And they're right next to each other. It's not as if we're hiding one or the other, it's hiding the elevator. And over 95%, 98%, uh, uh, most of the time, of people coming to our three-story space uh, use, use this uh, stair even when it's crowded and congested. Um, other stairs that do the same thing. Uh, well, I put this under elevators and escalators because there, it's a beautiful building. Uh, uh, Caesar Pelli uh, uh, in Minneapolis for the uh, uh, main branch of the library. Um, uh, these are architects on a tour. They're using the stair uh, partly because the tour guide went up the stair first. I, but while I was there observing, I didn't see anyone particularly using the escalators, which faced the wrong way deliberately. So, you know, you come in that front door and you don't see the escalators. There is an elevator there as well, uh, but it's not the first thing you see. Uh, and uh, uh, the stair doubles back and you see it. Uh, this is the rooftop, slightly better image, still not great, but of some of the architects and, uh, who, who uh, worked on the Via Verde uh, uh, project uh, with hair blocking her face. Vanessa Alice is also on our uh, uh, AI New York board um, and, and now a national associate um, um, advocacy director. Uh, but the scale of the project is about 220 units of affordable housing um, uh, is, we think, a replicable model. Uh, it was done, as I said, by HPD, our Housing Preservation Development Agency, when Sean Donovan was its commissioner. Um, we think that he's taken that same message nationwide at HUD. Um, but what is the message? That you could build a building sustainable and affordable uh, based on principles that also talk about its public health implications. And what are those? I mean, in more detail, uh, without taking too much time in one particular image or project, um, having a play space for kids uh, in a protected and safe courtyard area cradled by these buildings that you see the tops of, um, immediately adjacent to a laundry room, this is a public housing project, uh, that's on the ground floor and that has windows so that a caregiver, a parent, a grandparent um, can be uh, doing laundry at the same time as a child is playing in sight, usually in public housing and even luxury housing. Not that there are so many communal laundry facilities and luxury housing in New York, but used to be. Uh, those are in basement. Uh, same thing with the fitness center. Uh, There's a fitness center in this affordable housing project, and it's not in a basement. It's not in the leftover space. It's in the best space in the building, you might say, views of Manhattan on one of the roofs. You can get there. It's actually where that trellis is, you know, on the level by the tree, not the very high roof. But you can get there by walking exterior stairs, and when you're there, all the equipment in that gym is uh, in a well-lit, really pleasant, beautiful space, great views. Uh, but it's not about health centers. It's really about the stairs to get there. And it's about how active living and, and, and design creates opportunities to use uh, uh, just different ways of moving through a building. Uh, that could be done uh, with some degree of grandeur. Uh, uh, the architect of this particular building, the Tokyo International Forum, a commercial center in the heart of Tokyo, is a New York firm, Raphael Vignoli's firm. Uh, and he's used the same type of device of uh, calls it desire path ramps, um, bridges really spanning wide open large spaces in a courtyard in the South Bronx, uh, um, straddling courtyards in, in a courthouse rather, in the Bronx uh, um, for uh, health facilities in California um, and uh, other buildings elsewhere. Um, 
not hard to do. The question is, do you guess right about what the path of movement should be, or does that then create, as zoning would at a grander scale, the um, uh, added value of what's at either end of the desire path? Um, it doesn't have to be that fancy. This is a basement fitness center uh, at the NBBJ um, uh, designed uh, Gates Foundation building that saw a stair in otherwise. Uh, what was interesting to me about this exercise room in the basement is that it was immediately adjacent to significant numbers of showers and a bike storage room that encouraged people who were working at this building for the Gates Foundation to, to commute by bicycle. Um, fitness center was there, uh, uh, but so uh, were things that made that type of activity uh, somewhat easier. And then um, even the building exteriors. Uh, uh, this is the Brooklyn Museum. It looked a lot previously like the Metropolitan Museum, Piano Noble entrance. Nothing wrong with those stairs that were shaved away, but the entrance on grade animates a plaza that has now come alive. And I've got just a zillion other images, not in the show, of people bicycling and, and using that plaza, which pretty, previously was pretty much a dead space in comparison. Uh, I said I wouldn't use that word again. I guess it's all right. It has energy sort of in, in sin within it. How bad could it be? But um, here's uh, Mayor Bloomberg blowing the whistle. Uh, instead of cutting a ribbon, this was uh, just a few months ago on Pier 5 of Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, uh, what I liked about not so much the image, uh, um, other photos I might have shown are of both a professional soccer team and kids playing soccer on soccer fields that are in prime real estate now public park, uh, former piers uh, uh, in the Brooklyn waterfront, previously industrial waterfront, looking back at some of the famous skyscrapers of lower Manhattan skyline. Um, you can see the tall ships at South Street Seaport uh, uh, just beyond. Uh, so the blowing of the whistle was um, uh, sort of declaring the fields open. And not just the mayor, but other elected officials who were there were talking about the importance of active recreation in creating new parks, that it's not just about passive enjoyment, views of the skyline as it might have been or as it would have been in the past. Um, happens elsewhere, and the sense of community participation in planning decisions, the Brooklyn thing didn't just happen on its own. There was a lot of discussion about what was needed in a neighborhood that wasn't only for visitors, but related upland to um, locations in Brooklyn and in other cities like Paris where people didn't have the same recreational opportunities uh, because of income disparities and, and traditions reinforced by zoning of, um, of single use, often uh, mercantile uh, trade, um, uh, trucking. Um, uh, on the be careful what you wish for scenario, uh, there are so many bicycles in Copenhagen, and this is at a uh, uh, intermodal uh, 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 train station, obviously, uh, and, 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 and kind of a distribution point for commuter rail as well. Um, uh, I'd never seen this anywhere before. Uh, uh, um, people like Jan Gell are saying that it's such a problem now with so many bicycles, they've got to figure out how to get through it with cars completely. We had a similar project like that in New York where uh, Michael Sorkin proposed uh, that the Brooklyn Bridge, which has this great, you saw in one of the Fit City covers, people walking and bicycling, but in conflict with each other, uh, on, on the boardwalk of the Brooklyn Bridge, depicted in a number of photos of by famous photographers and painters. Um, that, that maybe all the cars should be removed from that and that one level should be for pedestrians and joggers and maybe one level for bicycles only. Uh, a lot of people commuting up and back by a bicycle between Brooklyn and lower Manhattan. Um, his proposal w was treated as not realistic, partly because he said, well, by the way, when, once you get the cars off the bridge, what the bridge connects to, which is an existing elevated highway in lower Manhattan on the East River, you wouldn't need that either. And you could just tear it down uh, because the cars wouldn't be coming off the bridge onto it. And I was on, exhibited in our space, a modest proposal, and showed it to um, uh, a couple of the decision makers who might actually be able to make that happen. And I said, you know, just like some of the other pilot programs of the Bloomberg administration, you could tear the uh, highway down temporarily and, you know, if people miss it, you can build it back up, you know, knowing, of course, that no one would miss it. Um, I think this is the last of these images. Uh, I was at a conference in Tokyo not all that long after the nuclear meltdown, and uh, it was much more consciousness, not that there wasn't previously in Japan, about energy use and energy conservation. And I was trying to relate that to, you know, my criticism of escalators, and I don't know if there's anyone here from the escalator industry related to anyone in it. I, I try 
when I can possibly avoid it, never to take an escalator, not on principle, though it might sound like that, not on a holier than thou, but for fear that some photographer will call out my hypocrisy. <laughs> and, uh, there's a great YouTube video of, uh, maybe some of you have seen it, of someone being stuck on an escalator. They're about halfway up. The escalator, just like an elevator, stops. They panic. They don't know what to do. They're, they're standing there you know, saying, oh, how am I going to get out of here? I've got an appointment. <laughs> And luckily, of course, there's another escalator. There are always two. They travel in pairs, and someone says, don't worry, we'll rescue you, and they come down the other escalator, go in the opposite direction, and that one then, too, stops. And you see them there, the people, the actors, obviously, in YouTube, uh, you know, figuring out what food they have, you know, what water, if their cell phone battery is going to work because they're stuck there. Escalator is, I, I guess, useful, and I have friends from Hong Kong who swear by them. Uh, you know, how do you traverse a vertical city without that opportunity. It can't just be by elevators and probably not there uh, by stairs. Uh, but, but what I object to is escalators that don't allow for even the choice of people taking a stair. So um, the fact, coming back to the slide, that with the loss of that nuclear power plant, there was diminished electrical supply, not just in that part of Japan, but throughout the country and certainly in Tokyo. People were starting to look at why do we have these escalators continually in use? And you do see in Europe sometimes motion activated escalators that aren't continually running. But just from an energy point al alone, you know, our stair prompt poster, this doesn't have the words on it, it's the last slide in the sequence, uh, says burn calories, not energy. Um, and, uh, uh, I subscribe to that. I think if we could say that the essence of the Active Design Guidelines book talks about how by conscious decisions uh, that increasingly become part of the culture, architects and landscape architects, interior designers, planners, city officials working in concert with public health professionals can talk about how active design becomes more a part of everyday life. That you think about walking someplace where there might have been a people mover in an airport, um, or worse, a cart. You know, uh, how, how does, without being retro about it, how does the level of intensity of daily life relating to physical exertion uh, reinsert itself in a sedentary society where most of us sit at desks, um, we go to conferences, we sit on airplanes sometimes to get there. Um, I've had friends in public health suggest that there should be standing or walking conferences. I haven't seen one quite yet, but then usually someone, especially from the public health side of the line, says, well, you've been talking long enough. Why don't we all stand up and stretch? So I'm going to say that. I've never said that at a conference. Why don't you just take a minute at this break point, just stand up and just sort of stretch a little bit, you know, and stretch your legs. Yeah. Take a deep breath. Uh, people who do this are really good at it. I'm not. <laughs> you know, yeah. We'll do 15 minutes of exercises, I don't talk anymore. But, but, no. but uh, uh, more seriously, uh, uh, how, how that's part of daily life is the design challenge. And, you know, uh, uh, David, um, David Burney, for one, says, uh, you know, architects used to design stairs as a matter of course, before elevators enabled very, very tall buildings and maximizing the use of upper floors in buildings. Um, and accessibility, of course, uh, to those floors, you know, uh, that it was a, a gesture. I'm looking e e even, even at this building, you know, how nice it is in this high room to have this balcony level. There's a stair that goes there. There must be an elevator somewhere, or, or we probably wouldn't be here. Uh, but I see the stair. And, you know, any number of old fashioned gymnasia would have, in this same type of volume, a running track. Um, around the perimeter. Just two anecdotes not in the script. Um, I was on the board of our local YMCA uh, uh, where I live and um, I was the only architect on the board uh, uh, and the project was to add more equipment to the gym, actually to build another gym and take over the pre-existing gym, about this scale, it was big enough for basketball, but not much bigger, uh, 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 for, uh, you know, for, for fitness center, kind of um, uh, stair masters and treadmills, uh, um, um, stationary bikes. And um, the um, head of the YMCA had proposed, well, by code, you could certainly fill in about a third of the area uh, with a mezzanine level, maybe even half, depending on interpretation. And that would add a whole lot more equipment. And I was just thinking about the quality of the space, including the quality of the space that we're sitting in. You know, if it were diminished down to, you know, um, 
10 foot ceiling or, or, or somewhat less, it wouldn't have the same character. So I suggested that don't lose the track, who knows, maybe those will come back uh, in the short run, why not put equipment on it? And, uh, and they have, it's some of the rowing equipment, it's different types of equipment, and there's a little bit more equipment, not as much as it would have been. Uh, the only other thing I've seen similar in the city of New York was a gym where when I worked in public works, so I guess I was the client or part of the client group, we were collaborating in the public works agency with the parks department in adding in a gym uh, right next to a juvenile detention center uh, in, the, in the Bronx in a neighborhood where um, there had been a promise in the uh, prior administration of Mayor Giuliani to tear down that terrible, terrible facility, it looked like the Bastille, um, and leave the gym so that people in that neighborhood who didn't have a, a, a gym would benefit from something that had blighted the neighborhood for a while. Um, Crime statistics were down, but not particularly um, juvenile crime statistics. The prison juvenile detention center never got torn down. The gym, therefore, never went to the community. A lot of political outcry, as you can imagine. So we were asked, uh, Public Works and Parks, to uh, get a gym built as quickly as possible uh, in a way that it could be related to uh, what was not done by not tearing down the uh, prison. Long story short, um, that 100 by 100 foot box not all that different volumetrically from this room, um, benefited, I think, by an insertion of what was seen by many as an archaic uh, 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 device, which was that self-same 1920s-style running track, uh, not used for equipment, uh, but increasingly used for things like observers for basketball, played in between, and by poking it out on one side facing a softball field as a kind of a bleachers, or at least a upper deck for people being able to sit there and watch baseball. It made the baseball field a little bit better, softball field a little bit better. Uh, but it was a design decision that wasn't easy because someone was saying, well, nobody runs on an indoor track anymore. It's either on a treadmill or um, outdoors in the streets or in parks. So I think if we challenge the basic assumptions, nobody runs, and, but, but what, what happens when the weather's bad? You know, too hot, too humid, too cold, too snowy. What are the opportunities that aren't um, just a piece of equipment, whether it's in one's home or in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a gym somewhere? And nothing against gyms, but too easy it has been for corporate heads, institutional facilities managers, lawyers to advise uh, them and others that you know, you want to give an employee a benefit, you give a uh, chit or, or reimbursement for the use of a gym down the street, around the corner, a mile away, um, and people get there. You know, I know I get to a gym sometimes, if I'm lucky, on a weekend. Uh, but if that gym were in my office, and, you know, talk about hypocrisy, why, why don't I just do that? You know, uh, uh, it's sometimes space, equipment, sometimes it's fear of being sued if someone falls or hurts themselves. But that's the kind of decision that, why not a gym like hotels have them, uh, uh, and maybe better than hotels have them. I haven't been to the gym, I think it's on the sixth floor of this hotel yet, but a couple of pieces of equipment in, a, in, in, in leftover space, as opposed to making something part of the experience and making it possible people feel like they could shower if, safely if necessary afterward. Um, what I wanted to do is uh, uh, end you know, early, with three minutes or so to spare, um, and uh, exit this slideshow if I can figure out how to do that. And um, I may need some help. Uh, oh, th th this may be the last slide. Uh, to get the guidelines that I referenced online, there's the nyc.gov backslash ADZG for active design guidelines. My email is there as well. But if I were to s exit from this one, you saw 70 some odd slides yeah. quickly. Uh, and open up the other one. Thank you so much. Um, pop up in a second. Um, just so you know what you're getting, it was much easier when it was a carousel, or people remember carousel projectors, <laughs> you could count the slides and you'd know more or less how much you were in for. Um, uh, except of course you would never know how long the speaker would go on each slide, and sometimes she or you would get hung up on one or another. So these are 40 slides. Uh, for those of you coming tomorrow, they may be the basis for a different, slightly different talk of just case studies that really don't require much explanation. I think they're more or less self-explanatory. Of course, I could go into detail on each and every one of them, but they're more or less organized over linear parks, including the High Line, uh, over uh, opportunities for 
walking, especially along a river, uh, waterfront and walking. And the, the, they'll speak for themselves, and I can come back to them during the Q&A. But the idea was instead of just having a loop of the first 70 some odd slides, that I'll just leave these flashing. I think that's six seconds per image uh, while we have more of a conversation. And I had all sorts of other Molly uh, Ivan's jokes in the script. And if someone would be so kind as to ask a question in the form of a long statement, I'll find some of those jokes while you're talking. But I guess the goal really in a Q&A is just that, uh, to start with the Q. And I'll do my best to uh, answer questions that you may have about the active design guidelines. I could have obviously gone into much more depth. And I'm hoping that some of you have read it already. Has anyone actually had the opportunity to do that? And great. Um, uh, uh, or to. Uh, or to, uh, or to see it online or, or, or download it online uh, or, or get a hard copy if necessary. I think we've been trying to discourage people, not because of the paper, relative expense of it, but I do have, as I said, a few copies here if someone needs them. So um, yeah, some of the comments you could ignore. You know, uh, I think the default was I'd rather be in San Antonio uh, uh, in whatever language. <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, I tried to work at least into one of them, someone saying something to remember. So um, what questions do you have? Let's switch gears. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, so my question is regarding the reconsideration of stairs within your office yeah. buildings. And how did you convince the city code officials to take another look? OK, so I'm going to say this off camera. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so repeating the question, that's a good point. There is a microphone there, I guess people may be supposed to come up to, but the, the question was about the uh, stair in our building at the Center for Architecture, um, and in particular, how we got our New York City Department of Buildings to do that reconsideration. Um, um, there are two or three answers. Um, I'd like to say that the primary one is logic. You know, you go to someone and they're a bureaucrat. I use that as a term of endearment. I was a bureaucrat, mid-level functionary. People who sit at a desk and are empowered to make a decision, have that authority, are doing their job if they make the decision. If they say, oh, well, this is the way it's always been. I can't even think about this fresh. They're not really occupying that desk. They're just putting in time until they retire. Um, and I saw a lot of people like that while I was a public sector employee who had been there for a really long time but weren't taking chances any longer. And it's a terrible thing to say you take chances with public safety, and that's not what I'm suggesting for a moment. But to at least look at the code as a living document. After September 11th in 2001, we really did that and changed the building code in New York a lot, especially on hardening stairs, making them safer, making them wider, having greater areas on landings where people would be safe if they were in a wheelchair waiting for someone to carry them down changing the nature of the materials that demise stairs. Uh, but we, because it was a safety consideration first and foremost, occasioned by the World Trade Center, of course, uh, we weren't looking at trying to insist that fire stairs have natural light, as we might have if we were more pushy. Uh, but New Yorkers are notoriously pushy. I'm a native New Yorker. Uh, uh, you see a challenge, such as a bureaucratic impediment to do something logical, and you just keep pushing. Um, it helped that not just me, but others I work with as architects knew their way around the building department. We weren't coming kind of fresh to the considerations of the gray areas in code. Um, what were the gray areas? Open convenience stairs that link two or three floors and are deemed safe because of other design features, deluge curtains, and um, there won't be any in this room. There are certainly sprinklers you can see. But if you wanted to have a three-level atrium in a hotel, and there are many in hotels going back to the 70s by John Portman and then many others, uh, you deal with it through the sprinklering and through the protection through a mechanism. And you have to be sure that that mechanism works, that you test the sprinklers if you're counting on a wall of water to prevent the flow of a fire from spaces where people need to exit. Or similarly, in an atrium situation, if you're talking about the evacuation of smoke because asphyxiation can be almost as much of a problem, that you test the mechanical system regularly to make sure that there's an evacuation of smoke in a place that people might be moving through. Even fire stairs do that. Uh, so we took the same kind of mentality and said, we promise, and we did, to test this system regularly. 
the way people test elevators. There are tests of building components that aren't just upon completion, that are through the life and occupancy. Uh, different municipalities have different regulations as to the frequency of an elevator inspection, but nobody thinks it's unusual to require that outlay of time and expense to have someone come and make sure that the elevator isn't just convenient but, but is safe. Um, we did the same thing with the fire stairs. We said logically if we could both put something in that is almost automatic uh, but that we would test and continually prove to ourselves is safe, then what's the problem? And they said, okay, you know, your architects, uh, um, you know, we, pro we, we believe you, uh, but reconsiderations in current New York City code parlance are, as I said, not interpolable. You can't say, oh, they did it there, we want to do it here. Each one is a case-by-case -case basis. So what we're trying to do is not have these so-called reconsiderations um, generalizable that under certain circumstances you could use it if someone else did, which is would be good, but half the battle. We want to just change the code. And, you know, I'm on a couple of the code committees, including accessibility, that talks to, with a model code that we now have in New York, we were one of the last major cities to adopt, you know, uh, international building code. That, that We had our own particular building code for 60 years that was archaic and a balancing act between different interests, union and developer interests. Um, uh, to say that we have a, a, a code that isn't politicized, that isn't polarized, but is actually increasingly relating to changes in building technology, that's the starting point in logic. So, you know, if the end point was uh, ability to navigate, not through personal friendships, and yes, I did know the building commissioner very well, and I did serve on her kitchen cabinet, um, and we'd work together, and uh, she trusted me, um, but uh, that wasn't personal. It was about the logic of the situation. Uh, it just helped to know who to ask. And anything, long answer, but I was afraid maybe there weren't any other questions, so uh, hopefully that generated a few more. I'm gonna try this microphone now. Great. I'm Jacob Dale, graduate student at UTSA, College of Architecture, and um, I guess I could ask you a lot of questions about buildings. You provided a lot of really interesting anecdotes up here today. But really, I guess on a selfish note, I'm more interested in what's been the setback on the city bike program. I'm a downtown resident of San Antonio and mm -hmm. probably one of the heaviest users of the B-Cycle program, so I'm really curious about that. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I think no reason not to be candid, far from home, and it's not really being live streamed back in New York, or is it? Uh, there are a couple of problems. Um, um, the most recent and most publicized was um, a storm that did some damage, we were told, to the technology um, um, as um, saline water washed over computer systems. And I believe that, you know, storing stuff in a floodplain when it gets flooded, uh, can cause damage, obviously. Um, but I don't think everything was stored there. You know, uh, uh, some stuff was, some equipment. Uh, so that slowed it down a little bit. Um, um, I think there's a political problem with free bikes, you know, with bike share. And, and that has been uh, a perception on the part of some that, um, first of all, they're not free. And they're not sort of equanimously distributed. They're really concentrated, at least at the outset, in some of the wealthier neighborhoods of the city, some of the more touristic neighborhoods. Uh, and that it's, uh, for those criticizing it, I happen to disagree with this utterly, but I'll put it on the table since you asked, that it's not really a citywide program. It's a program for those who, those who criticize our mayor say, get favorable treatment. I think the city has done more this administration than any other, and I've worked for a couple of other mayors um, as an intern and then as you know, a mid-level bureaucrat, as I said, to, uh, 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 to sort of spread opportunities around the city, not to concentrate everything on Manhattan. Um, New York City is a city of almost eight and a half million people. Only two million or so, two and a half million live in Manhattan. But Manhattan always seems to get all the good stuff, you know, the first bike lanes, the first bike share. So there was some pushback on that. And I think there was also a feeling that, well, the bike lanes might go away, especially those with just demarcated by some paint. Paint would fade, next mayor would get rid of them, and she might. 
you know, there, there are four Democratic candidates, equivalent number of Republican candidates in an election that's beginning to heat up. The new mayor will be elected in November. The Bloomberg administration has this countdown clock, 300 days and counting. Let's try to get everything done that they've been able to get started in 11 years with term limits, two four-year terms. It's almost miraculous that Mayor Bloomberg has had that third term. It took much more than a reconsideration to get that. But he did lose a lot of goodwill on the part of many who had supported him on other things, saying um, it's too much. Uh, so the pushback was on people who would rather not have bikes on their streets, saying, we don't bike. You know, it's the same kind of, you know, uh, not to put my politics on my sleeve, I think reactionary politics, if someone says, well, I don't have a kid in public school, therefore I shouldn't pay so much in school taxes. Um, if bikes get people to work easier, uh, especially in neighborhoods in Brooklyn, for instance, where the um, existing public transit is seriously overtaxed. Um, Williamsburg has been built up in ways without augmenting its transit capacity. Um, one can talk about mixed use as a mechanism by which people don't have to commute by trains that are elbow to elbow. We don't have Tokyo pushers uh, yet. Um, so it's not just that you bike or I bike, you probably bike more than I do, but that for those who are biking, they are not competing for the same place on a bus or a subway, and certainly they're not driving a car. And part of the goal of bikes in all cities that have done them is to reduce the reliance on private motor cars, especially owned private motor cars that occupy space, whether it's in a parking garage on the street or on the streets, in traffic lanes. Um, you know, a part of the health initiative has been shared cars. Uh, the Vélib program in Paris, which was one of the first, was best known, is paralleled in Paris by a city uh, program to uh, um, have publicly owned shared cars. You know, not just a rental car company startup or mainstream saying that you could rent a car for an hour or two when you need it. You know, so what does that do? Uh, if you can rent a car for an hour or two to carry something heavy or to go someplace where you can't easily get a young family, you know, to a suburb. Um, it means that people don't own cars and maybe they use them less and maybe they use a bike or public transportation more for the things that don't require a car. Texas, you know, I, I remember when, um, not so much Tory Carlton, who I should commend not only for instigating the introduction, getting me here, but for opening up the AI San Antonio, wonderful center for architecture. Uh, but also in Austin, not all that far away, Sally Ann Fly did something very, very similar. and. Uh, it's in a former gas station. How many, anyone here from Austin? Been to the Center for Architecture near the uh, state camp? Uh, the question of how much tarmac to give up in the sort of the mechanism of, of, of the, of the, of the uh, Center for Architecture, same, similar question in the AI Center for Architecture in Dallas. You know, how much, how much you need to park? Yeah, that's a tricky question in Texas, trickier than in New York. But long story short, there was some political pushback more, you know, on, on, the, on the free, um, on, on the uh, free bike program, bike share program, uh, but I think it's passed. So the real question now is timing. It's also, um, you know, to make something a success, both uh, perceptually and, you know, maybe that's also the press. Uh, it wasn't going to be rolled out in the winter. They missed the fall, was it supposed to be. To do that when you've got these incredible out of nowhere winter storms, it's been a lot of snow in New York this winter much more photogenic and much more logical, in fact, to roll something out given the climatological imperatives uh, in the spring. So that's what's being discussed. When in the spring, I haven't heard. Uh, the Jeanette Sadekhan has said May, um, and we're counting on that being part of a uh, first time ever design festival, NYC by design, a 12 day week in the middle of May. We think it's gonna be then, uh, but not for certain in the state of the city address, either by error or intent, the mayor said it would be in the summer. Uh, I, I heard that and perked up, but I may have been a mistake. You know, the tra transit department is still saying, transportation department is still staying in the spring, still saying May. Long answer again, sorry. Uh, you know, uh, the, the cities that have um, one, one third reason, that we're working with Alta, a great company, have done the bike share programs in Boston and Washington and other cities, including Canada. Um, they're saying the scale of it is a little bit more complicated in New York, maybe. Um, uh, what I was fearful of is having worked a little bit in Paris and knowing the Vélib program 
better than any other um, bike share program. Um, there are economic problems with that Veli program in Paris, uh, one of which is the extent of vandalism, um, some degree theft, um, and also something that was perhaps not anticipated is the one-way travel requiring trucking of bicycles back to the other end of trajectory. And I think there was a lot of investigation in New York to make sure that some of the problems with the Paris system that you don't read that much about weren't repeated. And I think we're past that. Uh, not because New York is safer than Paris or has less vandals or thieves, um, but I think there was an enhanced security mechanism or some such. We're, I'm really looking forward to seeing them. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is a big problem in New York, too, uh, because, um, you know, th those of us who've been advocates for affordable housing in New York say, let's get rid of the parking requirement. You know, if fewer and fewer New Yorkers are keeping or, or, or cars, what, maybe it's different in luxury housing, but, you know, affordable housing, luxury housing, why, why is the uh, one space per unit rule still in effect? And if we were to get rid of uh, parking requirements for cars, um, wouldn't that then make the cost of construction less expensive or free up additional space allowable by the FAR, the floor area ratio calculations and zoning resolution, uh, to just have more other stuff, whatever that might be. If some of it's below ground, it may not all be uh, occupiable residential units, but certainly some of the other things that are in buildings. Um, take bike parking then as a corollary imperative. If we're trying to incentivize the use of bikes, people's own bikes, um, and New York apartments are notoriously too small to store anything, let alone a bicycle, which is bigger than Fred Box. Uh, where, do you, where do you put a bike? Well, in a hallway? Not quite, you know, in some storage room. So if you mandate by zoning resolution that instead of having as much parking for vehicles, for motor vehicles, you have parking, if you will, for bicycles, well, yeah, they're smaller, they take less space, but still in all, the same argument, the same balancing act. So uh, um, we were in equivalent uh, collegially within the AA about how, to, how much to support it. I think on balance, we supported it very, pretty vigorously. And it's not just in residential and not just in affordable housing units, but also in commercial buildings. Uh, so we created um, not just bike racks in some of these images. You may have seen one by David Byrne on our sidewalk. Um, but uh, also uh, for employees of the AA New York chapter, a place in a basement to store bicycles out of the rain um, and to free up bike rack space on the sidewalk for transient visitors. Um, but not enough. You know, if we get this number of people to an event in our space, and let's say half of them were wanting to come by bicycle, there's no parking. Sort of like the endemic parking problem in New York and many other places. Thanks for the question. Am I out of time? Great. Well, it's been a real pleasure. Being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll be around all day if there are other questions. My email uh, was on the screen, bell at AINY.org, sim similar to the, email, the website for the document. And I guess I'm here tomorrow as well yes. in a different context. So thank you. I have some reminders for everyone. Um, during our break, please take a moment to visit with the UTSA students from the College of Architecture, whose work is on display, and they'll be at the lobby during the breaks um, for you to visit with them. We also have some tables out there that um, sponsors you can visit and get some.